Do you remember the first time you ever had to write a resume? Remember that first time? When you were young <laughs> and inexperienced and you had no idea what you were going to put on your resume. I'm thinking of our, our high school students who are, that's going to come up soon. And, and you're sitting here and, and you know, you're looking at someone else's resume because who has any clue how to actually write a resume? You just cheat off of someone else, right? That's the way that works. Like you follow what, what someone else did. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're sitting here and it's like, uh, it's asking, the resume says, my skills. And I, and, and I don't know about you, but I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, oh, what are my skills? Like, uh, I can talk like Mickey Mouse. Um, oh boy, you know, uh, you know, is that like that's maybe one of the only skills that I have? Like, what what would I write down on my resume when I first started? Um, and here I am, you know, 31 years old, and I still don't know what skills I have. But uh, you think about that. You think about that first time you had to make a resume, and it was hard. It was hard to fill that out because. Maybe you're inexperienced. Maybe you haven't had a lot of jobs. Maybe you haven't had a whole lot happen to you in your life. Maybe you haven't had a whole lot of opportunities. That becomes difficult. Last week, we looked at our enemy, Satan, and the powers that he has. We looked at uh, what's called sometimes the tail of the tape. Um, you know, you, uh, if you ever watch boxing or uh, ultimate fighting, um, you know, usually they'll have the tail of the tape where they'll uh, show uh, each fighter's accomplishments. Um, and so we looked at Satan and who he is, what his skills are, what he does, how he uh, works against us. Um, but today I want us to switch gears and I want us to look at our champion. What is on his resume? It may be hard for us to find things to put on our resume, especially when it comes to uh, spiritual life, especially when it comes to uh, the problems of sin and death and suffering. We really don't have any accomplishments in those areas. We can't forgive our own sins. We haven't eradicated suffering, and death still exists, and we are much acquainted with it. And so, we really can't write much on our resume. But thankfully, thankfully, God has made it so that we don't have to have much on our resume. In fact, in fact, He's made it so that the central part of, of His kingdom, the central part of, of our meaning of existence is that we trust Christ's resume. We trust God's resume. We say, okay, you know what? I don't have the skills that are necessary to tackle these huge problems in the world. And so, you know what? I'm going to take a step back and I am going to let God step in. What does his resume look like? I want us to start with what he has accomplished for us. Colossians chapter 1 verses 13 and 14 was our scripture reading today. Colossians 1 13 and 14 it says that he has delivered us, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's what God has done for people who put their trust and their faith in Him. How? How? How was He able to do that? After hearing all that we, uh, all that we did about Satan last week and, and all of his powers and all of the ways that he can trick and, and, and hurt and harm people, how can we possibly believe that He can deliver people from that darkness into a beautiful and wonderful kingdom that He can redeem us, that He can forgive the sins, all of the horrible things that humanity has done to each other over the years. Well, we must look at His resume to figure that out. And so I hope if you have your Bibles today or if you have a smartphone or something like that, uh, you would follow along and turn to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1 all morning this morning. 
Um, that makes it sound like I'm going to stand up here and talk for a really long time. That, I, hopefully not. Hopefully not. You will be able to beat the Baptists to lunch this morning, I think. So don't, don't, uh, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't fret. Uh, but we will be spending uh, a little bit of time in Colossians chapter 1. I hope that you'll grab your Bible and turn over there to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be noticing uh, verses 15 and onward. So first of all, from this passage, we're going to notice his credentials. His credentials. This is, this is his, his resume. This is what he has accomplished. This is who he is. Uh, this is what makes him as powerful as he is to be able to accomplish what he says he can accomplish. And the first thing we find that he is that he is the perfect creation. And I, I mean that not to say that the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, is a created being like an angel or something like that, but that uh, he is a creation in the sense that he became human. Okay? He became human like all of us. He, is one, he became one of God's creatures. Uh, chapter 1, verse 15, Colossians 1, 15 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is what God intended mankind to be from the beginning. If you remember all the way back at the beginning, Genesis 1.26, He created Adam and Eve in His image to be like Him. Well, Adam and Eve failed to be like Him, and every person after them failed to be like Him. They failed to do what God did. They failed to reflect God's glory into the world. They failed that, but Jesus has not failed. He is the perfect human and as the perfect creature of God, the perfect human, Christ has accomplished God's purpose for mankind to be His image bearer. He is a worthy example for all of mankind today. He is the perfect human. He's what we're supposed to be, the model. Okay, so all of our faults, all of our shortcomings, where, where we fail, where, where we fall down, he succeeds. I think this is the point of the story of the temptation of Jesus. You remember at the, the early parts of the gospel accounts, Matthew chapter 4, um, the, there, there's this time after Jesus is baptized that he goes into the wilderness. He fasts for 40 days, which I've uh, recently learned is extremely dangerous. Uh, I looked up what that, that looks like, and there is uh, an extreme danger of something called refeeding syndrome when you start eating again uh, that kills a lot of people. So just heads up, it's very dangerous. You know, if you get a hankering to go in the wilderness and not eat anything for 40 days, just be aware. Uh, so, so Jesus goes in the wilderness, he fasts for 40 days, and, uh, and he's hungry, he's tired, he's been away from people, he's, he's deprived of, of all kinds of nutrients, and Satan comes to him in this moment of weakness, and he tempts him. Okay? And, and you remember the story, he tempts him three times with three different things, uh, and, and Jesus, where, where, where Israel failed in their wilderness wandering in the Old Testament, Remember, they came out of Egypt and they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years and they did all kinds of horrible, awful stuff and they failed to believe in God. They failed to trust God. They, they just, I mean, were terrible in those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. He wandered in the wilderness, but He never gave in to temptation. He never turned His back against God. He never failed. And that is what we look to when we look for someone to be our substitute. When we look uh, for someone to, to be a, a vicarious sacrifice of atonement for us, when we look for someone to stand in our place because we can't stand, we look for someone who's, who's perfect. We look for someone who's perfect and Jesus is the perfect being. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is what we were supposed to be. But not only that. It's not just that He's the perfect human being. Uh, verse 16 lets us know that He is the perfect creator. He's not just someone who came to be in the world, the perfect human, but He's also uh, the creator God. 
Chapter 1, verse 16 says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is the perfect creator. He created a world that was good. And mankind and Satan have messed it up, have ruined it and messed it up. Not only is he God's perfect human, he is the creator of humans and everything else. As the perfect creator of all things, Christ is more than capable of making you a new creation. He is more than capable of making you a new creation, of doing a new work in you. He's not just the perfect creation. He's not just the perfect human. He's not just the perfect creator. He's also the perfect caregiver. He's also the perfect caregiver. Chapter 1, verse 17, Colossians 1, 17 says, And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Some versions say all things consist. He is the perfect caregiver. He makes sure that everything holds together and stays together and doesn't fall apart. We only exist because He sustains us. In fact, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says that He upholds the universe by the word of His power. As the perfect caregiver, Christ is the one holding our lives together, the one keeping everything from falling apart despite constant attacks from Satan, from evil, from uh, those weapons of Satan, sin and suffering and death. Christ keeps things together. I've told you all about my, uh, my favorite car, haven't I? Someone asked me, I don't know who it was, someone asked me what my first car was um, the other day. Um, who was that? I don't, know who, I don't know who was that, but they asked me what my first car was the other day. It was a uh, 1994 Ford Explorer, Eddie Bauer edition. Okay? So you know that it's uptown if it's the Eddie Bauer edition. I mean, it was, it was a nice car. It was older. Um, of course, you know, I didn't start driving until 2006, 2005. 2005 is when I first started driving. So it was an older car. Uh, but it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great car, but it wasn't the best car I've ever had. I've told you about the best car I ever had. That was seemingly just being held together by nothing. That it was a little Honda Accord. It was a Honda Accord, 1994, same year. I guess that was a good year for cars. 1994 Honda Accord, and uh, I mean, it had all kinds of things wrong with it. The, the speedometer didn't work. Um, the... <laughs> Uh, it just had all kinds of different issues. It had the, sp the speedometer stopped working at 193,000 miles. Okay, the, the mileage and the speedometer stopped working. I drove it for seven years after that. Okay, seven years uh, after that, <laughs> after it had 193,000 miles. I have no clue how many miles it had on it. It had all kinds of problems. It, it, it would uh, get to the point where it would sit there all winter. It would sit there all winter, and then I would go out and it would just crank. I mean, it, would, it was reliable. It would never spurt or sputter. I mean, I, it, it was just a, it was a great car, and, and it, but it always had alignment issues. It would always just turn. You know, I'm, you know, we'd be driving down the road, and I'm having to hold the wheel over here. And I, I, no matter how many times I tried to fix it, it would do that until one night, until uh, Kristen and I hit a deer, and it fixed the alignment. <laughs> and we, we hit this deer, and I'm like, oh, this is the end. Okay? This is the end of my wonderful car that I've had for all these years. This is the end of the car that I spent $300 on and I've driven for eight years. Okay? This is the end of it and because we hit this deer and then I go out and it has fixed the alignment. I mean, it, just, it, was, it was crazy that all of this stuff happened to this car and yet it seemed to still just hold together. I don't know what secret force was holding it together. I don't know. Duct tape, maybe, I don't know. But some sort of force was holding it together. But I want you to think about that. Our lives are a series of, of events where we are beaten and battered. 
where uh, just struggle after struggle, some people have more of these struggles than others. I think, I'm thinking of some people among our number right now, among our church right now, that are hurting, that are hurting. Y'all, we have a, a person here, she, she's, she's not here today, um, but she has lost four family members in a month. Four family members in one month. And not, you know, we're not talking about second, third cousins, we're talking about close family members. And we just get, people get beaten and bruised and, and hit uh, by things in their life. And as we said before, I, I believe that is the work of, of Satan. That's the work of Satan, God's adversary. But here Christ is holding things together. He's holding it together. He is the great caregiver. He's the perfect caregiver, and he keeps things from falling apart. He's also the perfect commander. He's also the perfect commander. Look at Colossians 1, 18 through 19, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Not only is he the perfect human, the perfect creator, the perfect caregiver, he is the perfect commander. He is the head of the church. He is the head of God's kingdom. Preeminent, that word, it means to, to be first in rank. He is the commander, the tip top. He was there in the beginning. Because of the resurrection, he will be there until the end. The Bible says this quite poetically, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The name of God in the Old Testament, uh, Yahweh, the name of God uh, is, indicates the eternal nature of God, the I am. I was, I am, and I will be. That is Jesus. He is the commander and He is around and will be around and he's promised that he will never leave us or forsake us. As the perfect commander, Christ is the one who tells us the truth, leads us down the right path, and is alone our guide today. So, these are his credentials. He's everything that we're supposed to be, the perfect human. He is the perfect creator. Not only is He part of the creation, He, he is, is the creator. He made and shaped and, and formed everything. And not only did He create it, but He cares for it. He cares for His creation. He cares for us. He cares for His creation and keeps it together. And, but not only that, but He is the perfect commander. He is moving His creation forward into the future to fulfill His mission which brings us to his mission. We looked at his credentials. Now we need to look at his mission. This is what he wants to accomplish. This is what he wants to accomplish, and his mission is this. It is simple, but it is profound. His mission is reconciliation. His mission is reconciliation. If you reconcile something, it means that you uh, bring it back together to where it once was. If you've uh, come to church here at all in the last two years that I've been here, I say over and over and over again that God created everything to be good, but then it fell apart. And so Christ's mission is reconciliation. It is picking up the pieces that fell apart and putting them back together. Putting them back together. His mission is reconciliation. I want you to look at Colossians 1, 19-22. Colossians 1, 19 through 22. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. That word 
Um, reconcile is, is a banking term. Uh, it comes from a word that means to reverse a transaction or exchange. It means to reverse or a transaction or exchange. Christ's mission was to reverse what happened in the garden. Adam and consequently every accountable person after him sold themselves over to Satan, over to the kingdom of evil. And Christ's work is to buy them back to purchase them back, to bring everything back to the way that it was intended. That is the meaning of the word redemption. He is to redeem, to buy back. That's what happens in reconciliation. And to, to, to look deeper into how this happens, we need to go over to Colossians chapter 2. So I hope you'll get your Bibles and turn over to the next chapter, to Colossians chapter 2. Uh, and we're going to notice verses 8 through 15 because this goes into detail. This goes into detail of how this works, of how he has reconciled all things to himself. And uh, really it's a jab at all of those who believe that the problems, the big problems that exist in this world can be fixed uh, by just more education or, or more technology or, or more understanding or more money or more government. or I mean, I, we, you can name many, many things. Uh, and here's a jab at that. Look at verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. It's almost as though some people said, you know what, I think we can figure out these problems. We can take care of ourselves. We can figure out these problems on our own. And Paul says, no, that's not the case. That's not the case. You don't need Christ plus something else. Christ plus philosophy. You don't need that. You have Christ, and He is the one who accomplishes these things. Look at verse 9. For in Him, Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. You have been filled in Him. You are fulfilled in Christ. There's nothing else that takes the place of Christ. You are filled in Him. Friends, there are things that we do in this life that are important. We, we raise our kids. We take care of them. We make sure they're educated. We, we get good jobs and, and we provide for our families and we try to live a comfortable life and, and, and uh, get education. Those things are all, all important, but they do not take the place of Christ. They do not fill us. And that is, where, uh, that is where all kinds of problems exist when we try to be filled with those things that can't fill us. Jeremiah describes it this way as people who are forsaking a fountain of living water, beautiful fountain of water, for broken cisterns that have holes in them that can't hold any water. We are filled in Christ. You have been filled in Him, verse 10, who is the head of all rule and authority. In Him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him in baptism in which you were also raised with Him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised Him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How did He do that? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This He set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. This last part, these last uh, two verses are what is important. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us. Now, that word, the, the word for record of debt is a word that was used often in the Roman world, um, and it refers to the... Uh, specifically to someone who was crucified. Now, the Romans were good at crucifying people, okay? Um, if you've watched, you know, any kind of uh, TV or anything about the Roman Empire, they crucified people a lot. 
And uh, what they would do was they would, they would nail someone or tie someone up on a tree and leave them there, okay? And then they would put their accusation over their head, okay? For all to see. This person was a thief. This is what happens to thieves. This person uh, was, you know, uh, deadbeat. Right? I mean, I, you know, we can go through the whole laundry list of things. They would put that over their head. This is their accusation. And what this says is that all those things that Satan would accuse us with. Remember last week we talked about he's, how he's the accuser? All those things that Satan would accuse us with. All of that sin debt that we have incurred, all those things that we would be accused with, Jesus set those things aside by nailing them to the cross. You remember, he was the perfect human. He didn't have anything against him. They had to put some, uh, some goofy thing about him claiming to be the king of the Jews, which he's the king of everybody. It was a true statement. But what this is saying is that all of the, the sins that we've committed, all of the crimes that we've committed, all the things that we've done, all the things that we've left undone, He has taken those and He has nailed them to the cross and He has paid for those. And we didn't pay for them. He has paid for those. And in doing this, in paying for the sins of the world, in dying and being buried, in, in rising from the grave. Verse 15 says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities. Now, there's a little bit of, bit of debate about those two words, rulers and authorities. But the majority of people believe that is referring to the rulers of author and authorities in the angelic world, okay? in the spiritual world. It's referring to Satan and his minions. Okay? It's referring to Satan and his minions. Very often it describes, the New Testament describes Satan and the, the, the demons that are under him as the rulers and authorities. And he says, Paul says, that he disarmed them. You, you may be sitting here and you may be thinking, if, if Christ wins, which that's what this is about, how Jesus wins, if Jesus wins, if Christ wins, why is all this bad stuff still in the world? Why is life still so difficult? Why are we still in the middle of this battle? Because Christ's work on the cross and in the grave and coming out of the grave, that disarmed the rulers and authorities. It took away their power. And one day, his defeat of them will be complete. It took away their true power. And it says that he put them to open shame. In the Roman world, if you uh, defeated someone, sometimes you would, uh, the, the Roman um, army would uh, parade those people that they defeated through the streets for people to laugh and mock and throw things at them. And so Jesus, in His atoning work, defeated the powers of Satan and put them to open shame so that they really don't have any true weapons or hold over you anymore. That is how Christ has fulfilled His mission. He has defeated His enemy. He has defeated His enemy. And He has done that for you and for me, and He is reconciling all things to Himself. He wins. We may not be able to do it. We can't do it on our own. But Christ did it. His resume is perfect. He is the only one who can stand up against that evil. And He has already put it to open shame. And it's just time for us to realize that, to believe that, that living in the kingdoms of evil, that living in, in Satan's world, that listening to his temptation and listening to his accusations, that that's fruitless, that nothing will come from that. Christ has won. And so how do we respond? What's our response? We might call this his compensation. Not that we can ever pay for what Christ did for us. 
Not that ever we could ever earn what Christ has done for us in giving His resume in place of ours. Not that we could ever do that, but that we respond in gratitude in some way. And there are two things here that we can do. The first one is faithfulness or loving God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 23 says, If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Con- continue in the faith. Faithfulness. Loving God. How do we respond to this great act of mercy and grace uh, uh, on God's part of, of standing in our place, of standing up for us against the powers of evil? How do we respond to that? We respond in faithfulness. We say, I'm, I'm not going to walk away. I will struggle. I will sin from time to time. I will, I will make mistakes. I, I won't be perfect, but I'm not going to walk away from God. I'm not going to walk away from everything that He's done for me. I'm not going to do it. Faithfulness, loving God. But then also, proclamation. Faithfulness and proclamation. Or loving your neighbor. Proclamation or loving your neighbor. I want you to look at chapter 1, verse 28. Colossians chapter 1, verse 28. Him we proclaim, Paul says. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Him we proclaim. Faithfulness, loving God, and proclamation, loving your neighbor. That's it. That's how we respond. And and that proclamation, it it, it looks uh, sometimes like preaching the gospel. It looks sometimes like telling other people about Jesus. But it also looks like showing people God's love. Serving God other people, showing people what it's like to live in God's kingdom, showing people what it's like to live as one of God's children and not as one of Satan's. This is what we do, faithfulness and proclamation. I want to offer you an invitation today. Uh, We try to do this every week to have a time to invite you to respond to the message. Um, You can come up here and and talk to uh, me if you would like during this time. You can um, talk to me privately. You could talk to one of our elders if you wanted to. We we just want you to respond, or maybe you're just going to do this privately on your own. I don't want anybody to leave here today without hearing God's Word and being changed by it, being informed by it, being transformed by it. We want everyone to be transformed into the image of Christ. That is our goal through faithfulness and proclamation. If you need something today, you need prayers, you need love, you need hope, you need to study the Bible, uh, whatever it is, we want to help you. We're going to sing this song. You can come and respond during the song or any time afterward, whenever... uh, the Holy Spirit moves you. Won't you please come as we stand and as we sing?